Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by Wine Access. They have fantastic Italian wines at Wine Access. You need to check it out today. Go to wineaccess.com slash WFMP to see the things that I'm drinking and wineaccess.com slash normal to join my wine club. The shipment this time was a lot of the wines that we're going to be mentioning in this show. So get on it today. Now let's get to the show. I am finally back from Italy. What a trip. First of all, let me just give a shout out to the 18 patrons that came on this trip because we are such a solid group. We had so much fun. There was, it's just always no drama, great time. Everybody's independent, but also likes to get together. I love that at the end of the trip, so 14 out of 18. I was going to say, most went on the previous trip, right? Came on the previous trip. Weren't they begging for the next one? They have already asked. They already want to know where we're going next. It is fun, and it's super educational, and we just have a really, really amazing agenda with lots of fun things and surprises that are unexpected. I will tell you about our day in Bulgari. We had some special wines that are not on the menu sometimes, mm-hmm. but are really, really amazing. So very special. It's a lot of travel. It's, a, you know, you have to have a lot of energy. But boy, I mean, the food, the wine, everything, just absolutely amazing. So that is what this show is on. And I want to, well, I'm going to delay the patron shout outs one more week. Can we give a shout out to a couple other people, though? Yes. You, uh, because you took I, care of the children for well, two weeks? Yes, that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I finally untied myself, a la Gulliver's Travels. Oh, very nice. Yep. Sylvia and Heather and Beppe. Now these people get to spend amazing time with you, but you've got these incredible contacts that really help make the entire trip a joy. Terissimo has been the best partner I could possibly ask for. And that's the really amazing thing is that Heather has been a listener for so long that when she reached out to me, it made a lot of sense for us to work together because she totally understands me. She understands what I do, the types of people that are in the community. She's a patron. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Right. And so I met her and Beppe when they were in the States. Right. And I just loved them. And I thought, gosh, this is going to be a really special Mm -hmm. experience. And I was right. And then they just hired Sylvia full time, who is just a firecracker. She and I just have perfect energy together. We love each other. Really good friends now. It was just a great trip. The whole thing. It's like family. That's what it is. And so so Heather and Beppe were handling the logistics and Sylvia was more the tour guide and you were the wine guide. So it's it's amazing synergies here, right? Absolutely. And it all works out great. And the producers understand my role. So Mm -hmm. if I need to ask them questions or we need to clarify things, it all works out really well. So you get extra information. They start saying things that seem a little bit odd. I will step in and say, Mm -hmm. okay, this is what that means. So anyway, it was such a great trip. I do have to say, I love love Piedmont, but because I am mainly a vegetarian, I do eat lots of cheese. I have <laughs> to say the Cucina Povera, the native cuisine yeah. of Tuscany, we were all in heaven. You the were best raving food. Like every oh, night. Gosh. Yes. It was just, yes, I'm going to have to go to the gym for a really long time <laughs> to make up for this. But what a fantastic eating trip, wine trip. And I learned so much and I want to share some of the major things that I learned with you. We can't go over all the details. Again, those details are on Patreon if you're really interested in getting into Plus, that. Plus, based on the pictures you were showing me, it seems like you went to some of the most beautiful places in all of Italy. Really, they are. Although we're not going to really talk about my Campania leg of the trip, which was unbelievable. We will have three producers on the show from Campania. Wow. There was one producer who I would love to have on, but they don't speak English. They actually spoke in Italian to me the whole time. And I have to say, I got like you 75 well. to 80% nice. of it. Yes. Nice. Another one spoke Spanish to me the whole time. That, was easy. <laughs> <laughs> that I get. That was closer to 95%. Um, How was your Latin? Uh, I'm really good at pig Latin. Oh, as good. everybody, as I made sure that everybody on the trip knew, uh-huh. they asked me about some Latin thing, and I said, "Yes, I'm excellent at pig Latin." But that's actually, you know, that's not true. I actually kind of lied. I'm sorry, guys. I know you're listening to this. Sorry, I don't actually know pig Latin. Einwe, Orfe, Ormolne, okay, you, like, you know what you're, Apple Pay. Do you know what you're talking? Are you talking about Apple Pay? 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's A. B, those sound like names from The Handmaid's Tale. It does, actually. Okay, yeah. and that's all. all right. Maybe that's where they got it from. Mm. Oh, who knows? It wouldn't surprise me. All right. As we get into Tuscany, I'm going to say this. The history of Tuscany I have been over before. But I took another look at it as I was getting into this trip. And there is a book called The Wines of Tuscany or Central. I think it's Wines of Tuscany. It's by Nicholas Belfarge, who's a master of wine. It's an excellent book. I don't know him, but I, I'm going to poke around and see if he would be somebody who might fit in with our family here to see if he would be interested in coming on the show because he really has some very interesting perspectives, one of which I really appreciated. He tries to put Tuscan history into context in the first part of this book. And it really did clarify a bunch of things for me that have previously, by especially the British press, been put in a bad light. And really? You, mean, you is, spent a lot of time there. That's kind of surprising. I think that I have always thought, especially Chianti, mm-hmm. is just always a work in progress. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you right now, that is absolutely not true. I mean, I've always had a lot of respect for Brunello and for Vino Noble. Sure. But one of the things I just want to point out is this. I'm not going to get into the whole history, but they have been making wine in Tuscany in a continuous line since 500 BCE, and that has never stopped. That's amazing. At some point, it was the monks. At some point, it was just aristocrats and the people working under them. And at another point, it became mostly smallholders. But the thing that I want to say about modern history of Tuscan wine is the following. Tuscany by me and others, I'm embarrassed to say that I've even cast it in this light, has suffered because after World War II on, they did a big quantity over quality. And really, for them, it was almost from phylloxera on. Hmm. So that was a problem. But the thing that I have realized through reading and through this book, which I think is very pivotal, is that Tuscany had what Piedmont also had, the Mezzadria system. Mezzadria is a sharecropping system where these smallholders manage two to two and a half hectares of Mm -hmm. land, Mm -hmm. and they give half of their crop or more to the aristocrat or the big landholder, Right, and they are allowed to keep half for themselves in exchange for living on the land. Now, that means that half is just enough to sustain them. So that means that these people could never get ahead. Right. They also were being incentivized. I hate that word, but they were being, the incentive was quantity. Okay, makes sense. So even if they were interested in higher quality, that incentive was not there and they had to survive. The Metzadria system was illegal in the 1950s, but it went on well into the 1970s. Wow. Given the sharecropping system, Metzadria, you see that there was really very little opportunity for anybody to improve upon anything. At the same time, the British, really actually starting in the 1800s, maybe even before that, had really taken a shine, of course, to French wine. It, always the funniest thing ever because the British and the French still it's really it's don't care for each other. Yes, but they can't stay away from each other. Right. And then when things did not work out at various points in time with the French, the British turned to the Spanish and the Portuguese And they also had some relationship with Germans. Hmm. But at some point in time, they just decided that Italian wine was not for them. By cutting off Italians and Italian products, which they fashioned to be lower quality, which is just insane. I don't understand that. This became baked into the culture of wine and the idea that Italy was less than, that it was a bulk wine place. Because no one would give them the time of day, Mm -hmm. they could not improve. There was no incentive to improve. There was nobody coming. There were no critics coming, right? So they had themselves and they... They were exporting, honestly. I'm glad you mentioned this because with all of the history in Italy, I've always sort of wondered why the French have a a sort of better reputation than the the Italians. Well, thanks, Brits. Jeez. But I do have to say a couple of things. One is that, but for the mass immigration to the United States Mm -hmm. and to Australia and other places, but really to the United States, you know, we still have a very strong Italian-American presence here. And the Italian-Americans were not just open to Italian products, but wanted them and were welcoming towards Mm -hmm. them. That 
helped sustain, not hmm. not boost the reputation because we didn't have back then the but power. Financially, through but imp- Financially, imports. yes. Yeah. Allowed them to continue to make wine in Chianti, regardless of the fact that it was in that crappy fiascos, the straw basket, which... I got to say this. Fiesco if anybody, like a type of wine. Let, let me just tell you something. If anybody who has any influence with Chianti can can listen to me, please hear me now. You have got to stop selling that in Torah shops around Tuscany. It is horrible for the reputation of the wine. It is not a good idea. If you want to sell it as a vase, go ahead, but do not put wine in that thing Why? because it's just cheap and it cheapens the whole image of huh. Chianti when you do that. I think it is a horrible, horrible thing for the high-quality producers of Chianti because when people see that, all they think is junk. Sorry, this fiasco. Remember, uh, like in the 70s, and I know a lot of some of our listeners. Right, right. But it's so it is a glass bottle that is enclosed in a straw covering. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And in the 1970s, every freaking parents on planet earth had that Chianti prominent with Chianti no that's where they it's only Chianti oh really but they're using but they sell it all over Italy and all of the food shops and stuff like that because it's kitsch but it really is terrible for the reputation of Chianti huh because no nobody idea. should be thinking of that I cheap, that, horrible wine I I as that. it's still sold. It's just, it's not a good idea. Anyway, I understand it's the legacy, but it's horrible wine and it really does no favors to the wine that we're going to discuss, which is such high quality. Huh. It was really one of the things that frustrated me most on this trip, which was like, God, you know, people see that and all they think is kitsch and they don't think high quality wine. They don't think, wow, Chianti is one of the best wines in the world, one of the most historic wines in the world. Mm-hmm. It is. And yet we see that. And all we, all I think of is like my mom sitting on the porch smoking cigarettes and like having a candle, you know, in the drinking 90s. it straight out of the bottle. No, oh. there was a candle in it. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right. to turn you're it right. into candle holders. You're right. You're right? right. Oh my God. That's, that's that hilarious. Was, right. Yeah. So side note there, but the history of Tuscany in particular is largely shaped by these occurrences and the fact that the British wine press shunned Italy for a very long time. And frankly, it was Robert Parker in the end who brought Chianti especially and I think Brunello to the... Really? Yes. Robert Parker loved Bordeaux, but he, because of the Super Tuscan movement, which we'll talk about later, he named Super Tuscan Super Tuscan. Oh, he did? Yes. Italy owes a big debt of gratitude to him because he put Italian wine back on the quality map because he had so much influence. He was the most influential wine critic in the world, way more influential than the Brits at that time. Right. And so that really helped. There's been some controversy around him though right that he's been so specific in his tastes that yes people started making wine just for right his, it is true and this is but this was really at the beginning of his rise oh, i mean this is okay. in the beginning of the 1990s okay and there are many many appellations that he brought to the fore now what's interesting is they all changed their style for him and now they've all changed back oh, to what they were traditionally okay. hmm. but for him there but he would not be prop, mad props is what you're yes, saying. Okay. He, he really gets a lot of credit, especially in Tuscany. Hmm. Now, I want to say that the wine that he liked was not really a Tuscan wine. But really? Well, I mean, it was a Tuscan wine that was was fashioned after a French wine, but we'll get into <laughs> that later. I want to go through really the five or six appellations that we went through on the trip. And I'm not going to go like what I did on my summer vacation because I just taught a class on the wines of Tuscany and the patrons got all of the details Okay, of, why of is that. the slide projector set up though? This is Oh my weird. God, you were the one who put my iPhone up on the TV to look at I the did. pictures. Yeah. Nerd. Well, because the pictures are pretty. I wanted to see it on a big screen. So after that history note, I just want to go over some of the places that we saw and thought some of the new things that I learned. So the first place that we went was San Gimignano. San Gimignano is very famous. It's a hillside town that used to have 62 separate towers, each aristocrat building one higher and higher. There were fortress towers for their families. Finally, they had to make an ordinance about how tall the towers could be because everybody was trying to show their wealth. But there are about 12 that remain. And the vineyards for the Vernaccia, Vernaccia is a white wine, 
are all around the village of San Gimignano and in some of the outlying areas. This is the DOCG of Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Is there any relation to Garnacha? This may be a really dumb no, question. No, okay. Not at all. Okay. Vernaccia is actually a very interesting grape because there are other Vernaccias in Italy, but this one is not related to any of them. Okay. There's been a lot of DNA tests on it, hmm. and it is its own thing. It's a white grape, and it has been famed for seven centuries. Seven centuries. Just let that soak in for a second. Mm-hmm. Vernaccia di San Gimignano, in some form, has been famous, served at noble dinners and was a favorite of the popes and all of that kind of stuff. And that is why in 1966, it was the first Denominazione de Origine Controllata. It was the first DOC in all of Italy Hmm. for this historic purpose, not for the quality of the wine. Later on, it became the only white to get a DOCG in Tuscany. Now, this is what I would like to say about Vernaccia. It's a great wine, but it varies enormously. Some are quite bland. Some are very minerally. The higher tier are aged in barrique or barrel, so they have some oak aging to them. It has to be 85% vernaccia with some other local grapes, but most of them are doing 100% vernaccia. It's on these marine soils, so this was a limestone area. Is there any way to ha- any advice that you can provide to help us separate the wheat from the chaff? I wish that I could figure it out uh-huh. myself because I've been unendingly disappointed with vernaccia. Huh. And I think, I said it in the class and I'll say it here, the better white wine for me, for me, remember my podcast, my opinion, uh, is Vermentino. Vermentino to me, which we had an opportunity to taste a good amount of, especially near the coast, is the better white of Tuscany. Now, granted, Vermentino is really the white of Sardinia, but Vermentino shines in Tuscany. The problem is there is no set DOCG for Vermentino Mm. or DOC for that matter. And so we're left with where do we go for a white wine appellation? It's really Vernaccia di San Gimignano. So the wine that I had for the class was spectacular. It's La Lastra. It is a spectacular wine that is all the things, Mm -hmm. the marine, the saltiness, the lemon curd, all of that all together. Yes. but. Other vernachas that we had on the trip, not so much. So it goes back and forth, and you just have to look for different producers. If you get a vernacha and it is completely bland, I am so sorry, but I will tell you probably 50% of the time, that is my experience. Hey, some of us like bland. Now, even you wouldn't like really? this. There's nothing there. Okay. It's just not exciting. Okay. And I think I like Vermentino because it is very alive. It's got lime and lemon, and it's a little creamy, and it's got grassy notes to it, and it's sort of Sauvignon Blanc-esque, but then has its own Tuscan character. Hmm. It can smell like herbs. It's really quite lovely, but again, I can't tell you, go get a Vermentino from whatever, because there's not an appellation for it right now in Tuscany. And I don't really see an opportunity for there to be Vermentino D, whatever. But we'll see. That is Vernaccia di San Gimignano. I will go along with our trip. The next place that we went was Chianti Classico. Of all of the places that we went, the place that surprised me most was Chianti Classico. Why? I thought you've always been a fan of Chianti Classico. I have always been a fan of some Chianti Classico. You and I have been there, and we have seen the beauty. It is probably one of the most unique, picturesque, unbelievable places that you will ever go. Only Chianti looks Mm -hmm, like Chianti. mm -hmm. They're not even allowed to put fencing up to keep the wild boars out of the vineyards because it is so gorgeous. So it's form over function, very Italian. But what I realized in Chianti Classico is, first of all, They have made outstanding strides in these wines in all of the research that they've done, especially the clonal research, which has really taken them very far. Stuff on the rootstocks. They've really worked on cover crops, 
which they put fava beans down. Actually, fava beans For are what? used a lot because they, they add nitrogen to the soil. Oh, wow. And they also help the soil maintain water. They add water to the soil. Hmm. And they do some cover crop rotation in every other row. They figured out if you do cover crop every row, then you're going to take too much away from the grapes. So they till one row and then do cover crops and they switch it up. Are you saying that you've noticed big differences since the last time we were there together, like 15 15- just like 13, 15 years ago? Enormous. Really? I mean, like a complete oh 180. Oh my God, really? Yes, huh. yes. Just a leaps in quality and in understanding the soil types. Of course, we didn't go to the same places and I know a lot more about wine than I used to, but instead of just being like, okay, well, here's Galestro soil, which is yellow and it's clay with sand and blah, blah, blah. They're like, here's Galestro soil and it's at higher altitudes. These are the kinds of flavors that it gives to the grapes. And down below, you're going to find Albarese, which is limestone. But there are many different pockets, and they know what each is going to give to the grapes. Now, it's not to say that they didn't know when we were there, but I have to say the ideas of clones, rootstock, canopy management, all of the details, the the geology, they have clearly made enormous strides in it, and you taste it in the wine quality. And the other thing that I will say is that we went to Ricasoli 1141. 1141 is the year that the castle was constructed oh, in their small hamlet. Wow. And we actually met Francesco Ricasoli, and I almost passed out. Everybody on the... <laughs> yes. You guys might meet some celebrity. I don't know. You might meet like Scarlett Johansson and be like, oh my gosh. That is not a, at all of interest to me. But I, on this trip, uh, I met Piero Mastroberardino, and then I also met Francesco Ricasoli. Of course, the two of them know each other. These I, are the people that have been responsible. So Ricasoli just... To give a little background on it, Ricasoli is large. They make a million bottles of wine. What I will say about Ricasoli, the reason that they are so famous at Castello Broglio is that Bettino Ricasoli, who, by the way, on the tour, we found out he was super eccentric. Very How eccentric. So? He took over Ricasoli in the 1870s. Mm-hmm. So this was right before Phylloxera. He had a lot of strange quirks. He was a aristocrat and received the king of Italy and he offended the king so badly that the king left after two hours. He was oh really God. quite an odd duck. But in saying that, for an aristocrat of the time, he was highly scientific, very interested in the vineyards, and he actually came up with the recipe for Chianti Classico, saying that instead of Caniola Nero, which had been the preferred grape likely, that Sangiovese was the main grape in Chianti Classico hmm. with Caniola Nero and Malvasia. And so he came up with the idea of what Chianti Classico should be. And for that, they are very famous. So they make a million bottles, which sounds like a lot of wine. How and many it cases is. is it it's 83,000 cases, okay. 83,300 cases around. So they make less than 100,000 cases, which to me is still a large winery. Mm-hmm. But let me just give you some perspective. One brand that I managed at the big hulking winery mm-hmm. was over 280,000 cases. Oh, geez. One of the brands that I managed. The smaller brand that I eventually managed was 180,000 cases. Those were the smaller brands. Wow. Just to give you a perspective, when we're talking about industrial wine, we do have to have some perspective on that because I, right out of business school, I wasn't even on the most important brand, and it was 280,000 cases. Jeez. Yeah. It's just an idea. So they're a big, small winery? They are big, but the thing about Ricasoli is the quality is amazing. They do make Gran Selezione, which I have criticized in the past, as I should, since Rufino, you know, that Rufino brand, yeah, yeah, makes yeah. 500,000 bottles yeah. of Gran Selezione, which is supposed to be your estate's best wine. Mm-hmm. But some of these wines are pretty fantastic. They make three separate ones at Castello Broglio Ricasoli. They were spectacular. So my message here is, you know that I like to support the small guys. And I'm going to give another example later on where smaller was definitely better. But in some cases, especially in Tuscany, 
sometimes bigger is better. Because hmm. we did go to another property that was smaller. Is it like an economies of scale thing or is it? I think you have to have the money to do the research on your oh. rootstock. I think you have to have the money to do it on clonal research on your soil types. You have to spend in Chianti. Now, once you get it going, right. you're fine. But I think that it is much more difficult for these estates that are smaller. And there aren't a lot of small estates, incidentally, in Chianti. And remember, the history of Chianti is that it was owned by aristocrats. Right, aristocrats right, right, owned right. huge amounts of land. So it's not like you're going to find some small mom and pop winery right. in Chianti, Chianti Classico. They exist. No writing to the complaints department about this. But aristocrats I, tend to uh, accumulate assets. Yes, yes and have big, sense. big tracts of land. Right. In Chianti Classico, don't rule out the big guy would be my suggestion. Yeah, that's good, I, that's good I don't, advice. I will tell you, I mean, I don't love the Antonori wines. I find them a little boring. But Castello Brogno, I think are the wines are spectacular. And the tour was great. And they were really, really personable. And I was shocked. I loved it. And the wines were spectacular. Like I said, we went to another smaller property that was really good. The wines were a little bit less reflective of terroir, which ah, I like more. Okay. Let's take a step away from the podcast to thank our sponsor this week. First of all, Wine Access, wineaccess.com slash WFMP will bring you to a page of my picks and it will get you 10% off your first order. Wine Access is such an amazing partner that especially in Montalcino, we were able to visit properties that never accept visitors. It is an amazing thing to call up a wine producer and say, hey, I work with Wine Access and have them be excited to host a group of people when they normally don't do that. That is the power of wine access. That's why the wines are so amazing because of their relationships with people all around the globe. With this kind of thoughtfulness that they put into all of the things that they do, not only are you getting fantastic wines? You're getting fantastic wines made by really amazing people. And this trip to Italy, more than anything, really solidified that for me. I am so proud to be working with them. If you are part of the Wine Access Wine Club, this month you will receive a Morellino di Scansano from Romatoria, which we mentioned when we talk about Montalcino. And you will also receive a San Filippo Rosso di Montalcino, which we were crazy about. Wine Access have such impeccable taste, free shipping when you order $150 or more, and that is easy to get to. They have a buy and hold feature where you can take a month to get to that $150 free shipping threshold, which will save you a lot of money. Wine Access is an awesome partner. If you haven't checked them out today, I believe in them more than ever before, if that's even possible, wineaccess.com slash WFMP or wineaccess.com slash normal. Get 10% off your first purchase. Also, this entire podcast is based on a trip that I took with patrons. You can only get on these trips if you're a patron. It costs less than what you spend on a bottle of wine to join Patreon and help keep the podcast going. That site has the chronicles of my trip in great detail. Please join today at patreon.com slash wine for normal people. And I will be posting new classes. I've been a little busy with the travel, so I have not had a chance to post new classes. But wine for normal people.com slash classes is where you'll sign up for that. Now let's get back to the show. Vino Noble di Montepulciano. This is the one everybody forgets to visit. It is small. It's a more homogenous area because it is small, but at Poliziano, they showed us a giant chunk of rock that had marine fossils in it. There really? used to be a sea there that huh. receded. So they have volcanic soils, they have marine fossil soils, they have clay. And the other thing that I learned, which again, you'll read this in books and it's just not true, is that they have not moved away from their native clone, which is Prunolo Gentile. Prunolo Gentile is the San is a clone that lives in Montepulciano. That is their clone of San Giovese. And they are quite proud of it. And they are not interested in moving to the Chianti Classico clones, which a lot of people have written about, and it's not true. How so, does it differ from San Giovese? Laura, who was on the trip, this mm -hmm. one's for you. Clones... Think about it like siblings. So there right. are some siblings, let's say in a really big family, there might be a really beautiful sibling that maybe doesn't have a lot of brains. There could be one that has it all. There could be one that is 
really smart, but maybe not so good looking. Mm -hmm. There could be one that is the workhorse. So they're all related. They all have the same family lineage. And when you look at them, they may all kind of look alike, right. but they're different. Got it. That is what clones are. Hmm. The Sangiovese clones that are in Chianti probably have a more closely tied relationship and they blend those clones together okay. because you might want the pretty one that has a lot of color and you might want the smart one that has a lot of gusto and you might want that, you know. But can so you have clones these, that are superior to the original? Many clones are superior. That's why they breed them. They do massel selection though. They do not do clonal selection usually. No, which wait, means you take wait, the best. Massel? No, not talking about the state where you used to live. Massel, it's mass. So you take a whole bunch of clones that have performed well in the vineyard yeah. and you graph them and you see which ones do really well and which ones continue to do well. And then you plant. So it's like selective breeding? All viticulture is selective breeding. You know, there's there's some extent of genetic modification here. Although it's not genetic modification because you're just taking what nature gave right. you and picking what the best one is, yep. right? We're not modifying it. We're just picking the best ones out of nature. Mm -hmm. Mass cell selection will give you a number of options. And usually Europeans prefer that because they will have the option from the native vineyard to have many different clones. So you're going to have a lot of different flavors. Clonal selection is something that the Germans came up with. And it's a very German concept. It's that there is a mother clone that has right. one superior clone and you take it from the mother clone that is the one superior clone yes it's very different and and actually it's a safer way to do things if you do clonal selection because mm -hmm. you won't have disease and it will be very consistent but it can also be really boring and especially if you're only blending a few different clones even in uh noble vino noble they will have number a number of clones of prunolo gentile that are slightly different, very slightly differently, but they still are Prunolo Gentile. And then they'll blend it with Colorino and Mamolo, which is a floral violet note. Hmm. I used to call it Mamolo because the biggest problem with Italian is that unlike Spanish, where the accent falls on the same syllable every single time, right. Italians play with it. And so it's all over the place. It's a little bit harder. The other thing that I will tell you about Montepulciano Besides the fact that there's marine soils and maybe that's why sometimes there's some salinity in the wines. Oh, uh, Prunolo has a lot of depth to it. Mm -hmm. I really like it. They always say there's juicy fruit. I like the earthiness. There's, it's quite herbal. Really a lovely, totally different version of Sangiovese, which is so cool. The spiciness and lavender notes sometimes in a Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Not the Montepulciano grape, right? This is Prunolo Gentile. Right. Montepulciano is the town. We're not exactly sure how the grape got its name. It must have been bred in Montepulciano. The town has been around since 900 BC. -E. But there was a Vin Santo, which is being shipped home, by the way. So you Nice. Will, yes. Well, it's sweet. I know you don't like sweet wines, but let me just tell you, I can't wait to dip some biscotti in this thing. It is Malvasia. And it is so delicious. I think we could pour it on ice cream. I like sweet wines under the right conditions. I think you could pour it on ice cream. Ooh. It tasted like caramel. Wow. And flowers. Yum. It was one of the most delicious things I've ever had. Vinsanto How is did amazing. You we it? had we just had it straight because Sylvia had had it and said it was so wonderful we couldn't miss it. Oh, you, yeah, that's right. That was her as like special little surprise for the group, right? Yes. And yes. it was fantastic. And many of us purchased it as a result. That's another thing I want to say about Italy. I have zero clue what the hell is going on here, but for all of their merchant savvy, mm -hmm. they had still have not figured this out. When you have a group of wine-interested individuals who are going to buy your wine and seem very much into it, yeah. you should be pouring them your best stuff because they're going to buy it. Right. Instead, they cut it off at whatever the level was. And we had to either uh, Sylvia or I had to ask, especially Sylvia, because she had been there separately right. on a scouting trip. And she was like, hey, I see that you have this single vineyard reserva uh -huh. that's open. Can I have a sip? And so then they said, oh, yeah, we didn't think you'd be interested. <laughs> and then you sold 10 bottles. Right. Of it. That's right. correct. They sold. Well, I bought two. And I know everybody else bought some. Uh, oh, I was, was saying, Rumatorio. yeah, you bought 10. No, no, I didn't buy 10. But <laughs> no. I mean, honestly, the people bought that wine because it was the best wine at Romatorio. Wow. But nobody did this, That's right? Funny. You know where they did do it is in Campania. They understood this completely in Campania. Why do you think that is? I don't know. 
Interesting, I don't know, though. But, but definitely, huh. definitely did it in Campania. The more interested I was, the more stuff that they brought out. Okay, then we had our Montalcino Day. Montalcino is the most famous of all of these places. Although Chianti, I don't know. Is, is Montalcino more famous than Chianti? No. I no. don't think a lot of people don't know about Vino Noble. If you don't know about Vino Noble, go and get some. I swear to God, it'll become your new favorite wine. They also make a Rosso di Montalpiciano by the way, from oh, the younger do. vines. And it's good. It's pretty good, but it's just a little bit lighter. The Montalcino de Brunello was outstanding. Whereas Rosa di Montepucciano from Vino Nobile di Montepucciano right. sometimes can be similar. Most of the Rosso di Montalcino, I have now figured out, tastes nothing like the Brunello. Really? Yeah, because Brunello is really something else. How does it differ? Let's say if Rosso has 20 flavors, yeah. Brunello has 1,020 flavors. Okay. Got and it. so much more texture, and it's worth the money. Okay, so ba- it's it's the Baskin it's special, Robbins of uh, of wine. Got it's, it. it's a special. <laughs> it's a special wine. It's okay. not for every day, obviously. Okay. But if you could drink it every day, you'd be really lucky. But it is an outstanding, well, outstanding. Can wine. you drink either one by itself, or does, yes. is it all? I mean, food I really wine? The, no. You can drink Brunello by itself. Because it's so good, like and it's so. so it's a med- they call it the meditazione wines, the wines for meditation. Oh wow! And Brunello is one of them. Hmm. We went to three producers; all were fantastic. Romatorio, if you're part of the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Wine Club, we did not put a wine from Romatorio's that will be recognizable in there, but they have a Morellino di Scansano, which incidentally I saw on many shelves in Rome. Oh, really? That's awesome. Yeah, so it was really awesome. So they make a Morellino di Scansano, which we'll get to in a second, another clone of Sangiovese, but that's a sort of a separate project. Then Castello Romatorio, really fantastic, interesting. It's cool. It's very high altitude. Artists started this, an artist and a winemaker started it. It's a very cool project, a little more modern in style. And that was the place where when we tried the highest end stuff, it was just it knocked my socks oh, off. It yeah, was unbelievable. Right, right. Yes. So excellent wines there. Then we went to Padaletti or we had lunch with Padaletti. They are the most traditional producer in Montalcino. There is nobody more traditional. They've been making wine for 27 generations. How much do they produce? Do you know? I don't know. We didn't ask them oh, because right. when somebody yeah. has been making wine for 27 generations, you sort of become more fixated on the fact okay. that they've been making wine for 27 generations. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if it was something like uh, that that I could buy or is it yeah, just Padaletti, so limited? Yeah, No, no, no. They have it here. Oh, absolutely. Okay. No, okay. absolutely. I bought four bottles, by the way. Nice. I loved how very traditional it was. Hmm. I don't know. I just loved it. They are so traditional that they do a much longer maceration. So maceration is something that is incredibly important with Sangiovese. Depending on how long you macerate it, you might get more tannin in the short run, but you might get more flavor and ageability in the long run. So some people nowadays, probably the average is around 20 days for Brunello, but they do it for four weeks for oh, normale, okay. right. And then for the Reserva, they do five weeks of maceration. So those are their best grapes. And they don't do any fining because they feel like it takes away from the flavor. And the wines were just perfumed and complex. They tasted like food. Hmm. It was like food. We were having it with food, but it tasted like food. It tasted like a bundle of herbs, some fruit, and just wonderful textures. I've just never tasted anything quite that striking. So that's Padaletti. What what food did you have it with? Oh, my God. They kept feeding us. They had fried sage leaves. What? Yes. Really? Yes. It's traditional for that area. That was fantastic. We had ribolita, which is the bread soup that was Mm, really mm -hmm, fantastic mm -hmm. with some of these brunellos. And we had frittata that it went really well with. Anything that had herbs, though, especially, it went really, really well with. Padaletti was amazing. And then we ended that day with San Filippo, which again is in the Wine Access pack. And Wine Access, I got to give them a huge shout out because they hooked us up with Romatorio and San Filippo who don't normally see people. It was spectacular. A lot of these properties you wouldn't be able to schedule by yourself. Or That's going, why these yes, tours are so I know, unique. I know. Montalcino, I still want to retire in. I still love it so much. I still think it is the best town in the world. It is so gorgeous. It's so full of the little streets and nooks and crannies, it and it's big enough so that there's enough going on, but it's small enough. I love, love, love Montalcino and the wines and the food and everything. 
But the big thing that I learned besides the fact that Brunello really is just spectacular, as is Vino Noble, as is Chianti. So I don't want to say that it's that much more spectacular Mm -hmm. than any of these others because they are all excellent. They're all different. Really interesting how Sangiovese expresses itself so differently. But my big takeaway from that day was there's a big difference between Rosa di Montalcino and Brunello di Montalcino. And um, San Filippo also gave us verticals. We were able to try wines from different years. Oh, nice. Those wines are spectacular. I will be having them on the show because there's some combination of so terroir driven, hmm. but also impeccable winemaking. Those wines are amazing. You know, we loved the Rosso di Montalcino yes, from San Filippo. Yes, yes. But I will tell you, God the Brunello. Fantastic. Another one. Just a great day. All three of those were fantastic. And all, all of these wines are being shipped back home now? Yes. Is that what you said? Yes, okay. they all are right. in Just transit. Sure they are in okay. transit. But all you right. can get them here or else I wouldn't be mentioning them. But San Filippo and Romatorio are also on wine access. Nice. Sometimes, not all the time. Nice. I got to give a shout out to Cristiano at Hotel della Fortezza, which is in Serrano. And Pitigliano, which is a another little town, that's the one with the that's hanging out of the cliff that's built into the the side with the grottos. Right, right. Oh Remember yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was I gotta fascinating. Say, hey, if you want, these aren't big wine destinations, but Cristiano will take care of you if you go. It's an it's a freaking twelfth century fortress that it you was, can stay. That in. was amazing. Looking. They just renovated it. And the views are spectacular. The food is amazing. They've got a chef down at the restaurant. That's the one that had the nine. Yes. They gave you the nine course, He's and you Sicilian. said everything. Everything was amazing. One of the best meals of my entire life. That's not hyperbole. You said that to me directly. We gave him a standing ovation. Really? We oh at God. the end of the meal, we gave him a standing ovation. The food was spectacular. Even if by course eight, I was like, Jesus, I can't eat any more <laughs> of this. I still force myself to take a bite of anything because it was freaking amazing. I would go back to Serrano because it is beautiful, but just for Fadalma. Wow. It was that good. incredible. So fantastic. And Pitiano, there's hiking down there. and I'd like to go back. Anyway, we went to Morlino di Scansano, another clone of Sangiovese. Now we're in the Marema area. Marema is closer to the sea. There are some very rugged hills here, but Morlino di Scansano tends to be in a little bit of a flatter area. It looks just like California. Oh, those that yes. place. Yes. 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 Okay. And the wine sort of tastes like that. So Morlino is hotter and it doesn't experience the what diurnal do you mean, taste temperature. Like that? Fruit forward? Yes, fruit forward. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So Whereas, and I didn't explain this well, in the four areas, Vernaccia di San Gimignano, in Chianti, Chianti Classico, right. in Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, and in Brunello di Montalcino or Montalcino, mm-hmm. you have high altitudes, almost 2,000 feet or 600 meters. Those places have massive diurnal swings. It does get cool. They also have more rain. They've got a variable temperature. So although there's a Mediterranean climate, it's more continental as you move inland. Chianti is actually, it can be quite cool, cooler than Montalcino, which really experiences no rain because Monte Amiata, which is the tallest peak in Tuscany, is right there and it's blocking a lot of the cooler weather and a lot of the rain. So it's very dry in Montalcino. Hmm. But the difference is that Chianti and Montepulciano and Montalcino are all on rolling hills right. at elevation. You're right. So you're always going to get different aspects, right? Because the hills, there's grapes are planted on different, right? Yep. And there's a lot of opportunities for blending. In Montalcino in particular, they blend from the south where it's quite hot. Mm-hmm. And it used to be that north and east facing slopes were less preferred because the wines were lighter and right. more acidic. But now because of climate I actually said to, yes, I I, had a funny moment with Roberto from San Filippo. I said, oh, I bet when you invested in this that people thought you were a little crazy Uh because it's east facing. And I said, now you're having the last laugh. And he's like, oh, yes. Nice. Yeah. So with climate change, the people on the north and east facing slopes are really where a lot of the coveted wine is. And the stuff on the south, they're having to figure out how to get more grapes. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. From buying grapes from the north. And people are trying to move up higher in altitude also. Oh, right. 
in Morlino di Scansano, you're not going to find any of that because it's rolling hills. You have a seaside breeze, which is great. But gosh, it reminded me of Sangioveses I've tasted from California. Okay. And most Morlino di Scansano is like a nice Wednesday night wine. However, this is my advice to you. If you have found in the past that Chianti or Rosso or Brunello di Montalcino or Vino Nobile di Montepulciano is too much for you in terms of it being earthy, in terms of it having too many different flavors mm-hmm. that you're not used to, Morlino di Scansano is a good place to start oh, for Sangiovese. Good, 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 good. That's really the jumping off point. That's a good point. Yeah. For me, it's an entry level into the world of Sangiovese, and it's very good. For me, I like those more complex flavors and right. the acidity, the high acidity, and I like the fact that you know a lot of times you can only but have them with food. if you want to dip a toe in that water... Morlino di Scansano is the way to do it, 100%. 100%. And then you can move into Morlino di Scansano Reserva, which Mm -hmm. is going to be a little different. And then you can move on to some of these other wines. The last place we went was Bulgari. Bulgari is in northern Marema. So Morlino di Scansano is in southern Marema. And again, this is all hugging the Tuscan coast. Right. Um, Morlino di Scansano is a little bit farther inland. It's closer to Montalcino, quite hot really ripe grapes. And then we get to Bulgari. Bulgari is right on the seaside. Really? Bulgari is where the Super Tuscan movement started. Hmm. Sassicaia, which is one of the most famous Super Tuscan wines, was started there in the 1970s. And it was Marchesi and Chisa della Rocchetta who owned some land and really loved Bordeaux mm-hmm. and saw that there was gravelly plots and decided to hire the best enologist possible to come and see what they could put down and made their family wine, which was a Cabernet Sauvignon blend. It is called Sasakaya, which means, I think, Stony Creek or Stony Land, something like that. That started, but that was not commercially available. And then... Piero Antonori, who, by the way, is the nephew of the Mark, because this entire area is like Antonori or Marchese and Chesa della Rocchetta. Right. Because the Antonori's own huge amounts of land Jeez. that was gifted to them. This is why you can't go always for small in mm-hmm. these areas because a lot of it is owned, Bulgari especially. Our ancestors really toast us. Oh my gosh. Right? I know. I mean, we were like, mine were like hauling like water and right, like, uh, right. I don't know, baking bread Why in the Ukraine. weren't they gifting us land like that? I have no idea. My Ugh. family's like 90% of my family's from Ukraine. We're probably cutting wheat or whatever. It's Yeah, it's terrible that we didn't get the aristocrats for our family. But I think that's what I was saying before. I think most people don't get that. Yeah, I guess you're right. But anyway, Pierre Antonori decided to make a wine called Tignanello. Now, that wine was mostly Sangiovese, but with about 15% Cabernet Sauvignon. It was released for the 1978 vintage. It was out of Chianti Classico. It was declassified to table wine. The Italians did not like it because it had Cabernet Sauvignon in it. It was heavy and robust, but Americans really liked it. They were able to charge a lot for it. it. And then eventually Robert Parker really got into all of these wines from Bulgari, Sassicaia, and then there was another branch of the Antonori family that started a winery called Ornalaya and Solaya and Massetto. Massetto is the most one of the most expensive wines in Italy to this day. Oh, it is a super Tuscan also. Yeah. And Robert Parker coined them super Tuscans because they were Tuscan wines with French grapes in them. They were preferred to the wines of Chianti and Vino Noble. Brunello was on its meteoric rise at this point. Right. Also, so Tignanello, Sassicaia, and then later on Ornalaya, Massetto wound up being these huge sensations and put Tuscany back on the map. Interesting. Do you know what Tignanello means or like where that name came from? You know, they didn't explain that to us, although we did drink a bottle while we were in the Antonori estate. Really? Tenuta Guado a Tasso. Yes, really, really quite good. Tignanello means young shoot, S-H-O-O-T, which is a symbol of life and rebirth in Italy's Etruscan culture. So they were trying to revive the culture, that which makes is really a lot of cool. sense now. Okay. Yes. Bulgari, I just want to say, is flat as a pancake. It looks like huge vineyards in Napa mm-hmm. on the Napa Valley floor. Yep. There's an amphitheater of mountains surrounding, surrounding it, it right. surrounding the big. I mean, but this is 750 acres or 320 hectares of vineyards just for Guado wow. El Paso. That's one Antonori estate. It's enormous. That's These nuts. estates are very big and very flat. How do you manage estates that big? 
I have no idea. You have a lot of money, so that kind of helps. So the Antonoria estate was enormous. They did pour us Tignanella, which is great. They also poured us the Guadalajara, which is fantastic. It was a great experience, very buttoned up, very yeah. formal, yeah. and it looked just like either Dry Creek in Sonoma, uh-huh. wherever, it did. The you know, those Valley Floor. Like, know, yes, it was, it was it's on. just crazy. And then when you get out into the vineyards, these huge vineyards, I mean, it looks a little bit like Central Valley vineyards yeah. also, you I'm know, because it was very like flat. And like mountains. Yeah. No, Salinas is Central Coast, but Central Valley, like Modesto, oh, and, right, right, yeah, right, yeah. where it's just flat and vineyards for miles and miles and miles. The only difference is if you look out far enough, you see the sea because we are on the Tyrrhenian Sea, only about six or eight kilometers from the sea. Actually, they do get sea breezes there. But in Bulgari, they don't grow much Sangiovese. They grow Cabernet, Cabernet Franc. They grow Merlot. They have Petit Verdot. They grow Vermentino. Sangiovese likes to grow at altitude. It does not like flat places. So if you don't have altitude, it's not going to do very well. Sangiovese is much better off in these internal places, also where there's rain, where there's good temperature fluctuations, so you can keep acidity. So Bulgari is really a French grape appellation, with the exception of Vermentino. And it's got alluvial soils from wash down on that valley floor. Right. It has sandy soils because we're right near the sea. Mm -hmm. So not typical Tuscan. It doesn't look like what you'd expect from Tuscany. I am going to have somebody on the show who has a small estate in Bulgari. Oh, The wines me. were spectacular. Uh-huh. It is Le Vigne di Silvia. I'm going to have her sister, Stefania, on. Stefania and Silvia are young, and they are these two beautiful... I mean, they just remind me of like me and my sister, the relationship between them. Silvia was a professional soccer player. Wow. She told her parents when she was young she wanted to be a soccer player and a farmer. Okay. Check yep. on the professional soccer player, and now she's a farmer. Now check on her the dad farmer. gave her... Her dad said, I never want anything to do with wine. So he grows basil and a number of other crops. That's and hilarious. he gave her as a gift when she retired from soccer recently, this tract of land and said, if you want to be a farmer, here you go. And she said, I'm planting grapes. And she, and she lured her sister back who was living in New York. Oh and her gosh, sister Stefania hilarious. is going to be on the show because Sylvia doesn't really speak English. The wines were spectacular. They make three wines. They are a young company. I have 100% confidence that they will be getting distribution because they are that good. They were among some of the best wines that we had, certainly the best in the Marema area and better than Antonori, I thought. That's incredible. Yeah. And so well, I'm, I'm anxious to hear their story. Yeah. They're just wonderful people. So that is all we're going to do for now because that's a lot of information. Yep. The trip was fantastic. The food was fantastic. I think hopefully I've delivered the some learning. Were yes, the people yes. were just spectacular everywhere we went. Such great hospitality. I hope that I was able to impart some little nuggets of information about each of these major appellations in Tuscany. The main theme is that the improvements that I have seen in all of these regions is just staggering. I well, good, feel that's better why than I was ever. Waiting to go back. I yeah. wanted to make sure okay, it improved. Good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So now I feel like it's up to my standards. Yep. Yes. I, th- I think better good. than ever. Better than ever. It is such a pleasure to see such pride, such great improvement, and the fact that they're aware that they have made such great strides mm-hmm. and that they are still making strides. Nobody's stopping. It really no makes a big on difference. Their laurels. No. It makes a big difference. And these wines, you can't compare them to the wines of Piedmont. You can't compare them to anything. They are individual and they are so Tuscan in the way that they express themselves. The the land and the wine go hand in hand Mm -hmm. and always tell you about food and about how important food is. And it really does make a big difference with these wines. I would not try, maybe with the exception of Brunello, I really don't like to have these wines without a little snack mm-hmm. because they really do shine with food. They are Not spectacular. Not because they're bad on their own, but you're saying that the food really brings out the the, the variety of yes, f- complexity. The as- yes, the acidity in these wines can make them tough to take on their own. Some of them have tannin. But they are so spectacular with food. What they've been able to coax out of the grapes, right. the complexity. I'm excited for the future of Tuscany. I feel like I have a better grasp on how they got into the place that they did in people thinking that they were less than right. at all of Italy, really, for that matter. If you're not familiar with these regions, please familiarize yourself with them. And I did go to Campania. I was there for three full days, and it was glorious. So this glorious. was after your tour, right? Yes, it was glorious. 
but we are going to have some producers on from Campania, including Antonio Cabaldo from Feo di San Gregorio, who hosted me, and I could not be more grateful. Piero Mastroberadino, who spent so much time with me. I adored him. Roberto De Meo, if you haven't had those Fianos, oh, I mean, Fiala. just, and the Tarazi, all of the, all of those wines are just absolutely spectacular. I would love to have the people on from Petalia, but they don't speak English. One after the other, a great, great visit. I learned a lot. We'll have to do that in another episode and with the producers when we have them on. So that's what I've got on the trip to Tuscany. I hope that this was helpful. I hope it allowed you a little armchair travel and that you're drinking some Tuscan wine while you're listening to this. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.